Thank you, Mary Jo. Um, Tenzin and I are just delighted to be here today. We thank Mary Jo for suggesting this webinar series and thanks to Molly for working on, on developing it. Uh, Tenzin actually is in India today. I'm in my home in Golden Valley. So uh, Tenzin, do you wanna start our slide presentation? We are gonna talk about um, creating a health, healthier mind and live joyfully. This is the key to Tibetan wisdom from the top of the world that we need a healthier mind, then we will make healthier choices and accomplish the purpose of life, which is to be happy. Okay, uh, next one, please. Here is a statement from the book that Mike, that um, Tenzin and I just wrote or published. All of us want to be happy and avoid suffering. Yet too often we make choices that sabotage us rather than reverse what's wrong. Tibetan medicine, Tibet's ancient comprehensive science of healing, offers effective tools for transforming suffering into health and joyful living. So that's what we're going to focus on in this webinar. In the next webinar on May 17th, we will talk about how we can create a healthier, happier body. Okay, what is Tibetan medicine? <clears throat> Tibetan wisdom. Soa Rigpa is the Tibetan name, and it means the ancient yet timely science and knowledge of healing from Tibet. Uh, Tibetan medicine teaches that the purpose of life is to be happy. I don't know about you, but when I first read that, I thought, oh my goodness, really? And it sort of uh, ends up with a focus in life. I grew up as the daughter of a fundamentalist evangelical Lutheran minister, and I'm Norwegian Swedish ancestry. And certainly I wasn't taught that the purpose of life was to be happy. That seemed too decadent. So this has been tran life transforming just to read this, this purpose. And, and my students, I've been teaching Tibetan medicine for decades now, and my students too find that Tibetan medicine is life transforming by making this the purpose of life. <clears throat> and well-being is a lifelong process of living in harmony with ourselves, with others, with all beings, and with our planet. For centuries, Tibetan medicine doctors have conducted research now scientific researchers are finding positive results of, 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 uh, on the various components of Tibetan medicine. In, in fact, just today, uh, I read about research about having a positive viewpoint and it extends life. One's life is much happier, one makes better choices by having a positive viewpoint. Okay, today we're gonna talk about four uh, concepts. And those of you who've gone to Tencent's and my uh, talks before have heard about these, but Tibetan medicine uh, can be understood on many different levels, from superficial to profound. So we want to go through these principles again, because they, they are the uh, cornerstone of Tibetan medicine. Karma, first of all, which is the universal law of cause and effect, and according to Tibetan medicine, we need to choose what produces balance, health, and happiness. Uh, in my research, I've conducted four research studies about ethics, ethical problems. In every one of these research studies, the participants said they wanted to make choices that led to good consequences, not poor choice consequences. But too often, we don't do that. Instead, we make choices that lead to suffering. So suffering means unhappy feelings resulting from mental poisons and unhealthy choices. And all over the world, people are suffering. And Tibetan medicine, Tibetan wisdom gives us tools for changing that suffering into healing and happiness. So healing needs to root out and transform negativity into wisdom, compassion, and sustainable peace. Then finally, if we live in this way, we will cultivate characteristics that create joy, we will bloom like a lotus flower. Okay, Timson now is gonna talk about karma and suffering. Thank you, ma'am. 
So I would, I would assume that most of us here today you, uh, who have joined us would have some understanding of the concept of karma in Tibetan Buddhist culture, as well as in Indian Hindu culture. Uh, so karma, we look, we're looking at the impact of cause and effect, right? But before we understand uh, how do we conceptualize the cause and effect and apply that in our daily life, Let's present uh, here the, the way the Tibetan medicine uh, interpretation of karma works here. So first of all, look at how, how in Tibetan medicine, uh, how do we understand our body itself, right? Even though our focus for today's talk would be creating a healthy mind, but before we go into creating a healthy mind, we'll be looking at the underlying components of our body itself, which supports our mind, right? So in Tibetan medicine, we say that all phenomena is consists of energy. So what do we mean by that? So in, uh, like many other traditional medical systems, such as Chinese medicine, Indian Ayurveda, or Yunani, or even Siddha medicine, in Tibetan medicine, when we talk about energy, we're talking about five elements. So the five elements, i.e., which would be earth, water, fire, air, and space, in the context of Tibetan medicine, we usually say that from the very beginning of the conception uh, of any one of us in our mother's womb, the five elements has to interact and work together. And so the, those five elements could be from our parents uh, or could be from anything in our environment. Now, the first one is the earth element, right? So when we try to understand what is earth element in most of the traditional medical systems, the, the emphasis in using metaphor is key. So here, when you try to understand earth, we don't necessarily mean the literal earth itself, but the components or the characteristics of earth that forms our body, informs or, or shapes our body. And so here, when we talk about earth, we're looking at the stability, we're looking at the structure of our body. Now, uh, the second one is water. So without water, we won't have moisture, right? Without water, we won't have that smoothness in our system. And so, and also I wanted to let all of you know that we won't be delving too deep into this particular components because as Mim mentioned earlier, on May 17, when we uh, would work on understanding how to create a healthy, healthy body, then we will talk a little bit more in detail about what, what we are presenting here in this particular slide. So the third one is the fire element. And so, of course, what does the fire bring? And, and in so many ways, it could be uh, quite easily understood that, okay, when we think about fire, it's something that, that can uh, mature, they can kind of help to grow, right? And so here we are very much looking at the importance of bringing in the fire in addition to earth and water element, because not only helps to mature and grow, but also helps to develop. And so for instance, when we are conceived in mother's womb, uh, each and every day and every week and every month, uh, we need to have that fire element in order for our in, in order for embryo to grow and develop yet at the same time the nutrition uh, the uh, the fetus is getting from mother it has to be it has to be absorbed and so therefore the fire comes into play and of course when we when we are born uh, each and every movement and day and uh, week and month and so forth uh, the fire element work together along with earth and water element. And finally, the air element. We need to have air element, right? Without which any of those movement, any of those stimulation would be, would, would, won't be there. And so at the very basic level, rudimentary level, air element really works as a kind of any form of movement that's happening in our body. Uh, as and when it developed further and when we were born, it started to develop into uh, a much more uh, full-fledged, well-functioning nervous system, right? Now, the, finally, the space uh, element. So space elements, element is always there because without which none of the four elements that we, which, uh, I presented earlier here on this slide would be able to exist. And so what happened is 
the space element helps the four other elements not only to coexist, but also they are able to interact, communicate with each other. And so, therefore, in the context of Tibetan medicine, all of us are consist of five, same five elements of energy. So we all share that energy. Uh, and then, just like the within our body, the five elements or the four elements uh, coexist in the space and interact with, you, with each other, there's a more kind of an intra-relationship that's happening in there, right? But the inter-relationship, then again, we, we interact with uh, anything in our environment which involves any, all other species and, and, and our planet. Now, the, the extension of the five elements is each of these five elements manifests in the form of different uh, principal energies or system uh, in our body and according to Tibetan medicine and very similar to again Indian or Chinese medicine or Yunani medicine here. Now the first one we usually say uh, in the Western kind of uh, uh, textual inter interpretation, it has been tra translated as three primary energies, but in Tibetan medicine, we refer to as Nyeba Sum, right? So Sum means three, Nyeba means false. Now the first one is Lung. So Lung here, again, in a simplistic manner, we can, we can interpret it as movement energy, but again, we can understand it as a nervous system, right? And so in Ayurveda medicine, we're almost, same but uh, articulated differently as Vata. Now, uh, and Lung is the manifestation of air element that in previous slide we talked about. And the second one is the Tipa, which is the manifestation of fire element. Uh, and then we can understand it as a heat energy and same as Yang in Chinese medicine or Pitta in Ayurveda. And, and of course, we wanted to make sure that all of us here uh, uh, who have joined us and also the back and center where the the emphasis on integrative medicine and so we wanted to make sure that you all get uh, a kind of a snippets of the intersection that's happening between all these different traditional medical systems and finally earth and water element manifest in the form of pagan so pagan system or uh, primary energy, it's more cold energy, right? And so as we can see that since it's the manifestation of earth and water element, they not only uh, provide the structure, but also moisture, as well as the, uh, the, the kind of uh, uh, way to help our body to stay in balance, whether or not to get too much heated up, and so the water will help to, to bring our body in the state of homeostasis. And so in Chinese medicine, it could be understood as yin and in Ayurveda, kapha. Now, uh, one thing which is really uh, might look quite simple, but fascinating is how in traditional medical system, when we think about how we can actually live in harmony or uh, peacefully, or we can say sustainably with oneself and others and our planet. And as, as I mentioned earlier, that our body is very much based on five elements and how each of these five elements inform our body's physical system, right? So therefore, when we talk about health and happiness, it's very much the, the, the right balance or the, the harmonious relationship that we are able to build up both within ourselves and with everything in our vicinity, in our environment. Well, contrary to that, if any of these states goes into imbalanced form, then it can lead to suffering uh, and disease. So therefore, we constantly need to juggle between how we can actually, because it's our body and mind always seems to stay in a very dynamic state of uh, dynamic states, and therefore it can always go into bal imbalance. And then what we need to do is we need to reverse, we need to bring that, uh, that uh, balance back into play. So therefore the reversing suffering and disease require correcting the underlying imbalance. And what are those imbalances? First, we think about the three primary energies of Lung, Tepa, and Pekin. But then we can go a little more deeper 
and how and how we can go there and then we think about the element of earth water fire and space and therefore it's a very much a kind of a planetary hell that now in today's day and age we start to focus on the, we need to live with our environment and therefore our physical five elements and environmental five elements really comes into play I mean, please oh oh i'll be oh, sorry yeah i'll be i'll continue to go for a few more slides and so now as i as, as i just mentioned that how in a state of imbalance can lead to suffering right and so in you know indian ayurveda term uh, it's a dukkha and suffering and and in some of the texts people would also translate as a dissatisfaction but in in the original or primary text both in tibetan and indian sanskrit texts uh the uh it's very much interpreted as suffering, right? Whether it's a dukkha or it's a dunya in Tibetan uh, terms. So, but in order to understand uh, the suffering, which is the first of the noble truth, so there are four noble truths, right? The first of the truth is the is the truth of suffering. So, uh, the a little bit of nuances of understanding of suffering here is a three different levels of suffering that has been articulated in Tibetan Buddhist medicine. The first one is the suffering of suffering, which is quite obvious, right? I mean, the, the suffering of being born, uh, the, uh, when we are born, uh, it's inevitable that we will fall, we will fall ill and the, our body will start to change, degenerate, and one or other form of uh, illnesses, uh, uh, illness would come and also depend upon our diet and lifestyle. And then we all will start to age and with aging, different, uh, kinds of illnesses will start to arise and so therefore that's a suffering of suffering and so we usually say that when we are born then the the byproduct of being born into the world is the disease and aging and death and of course if you read between the lines there's so many other things uh, which could lead to suffering that leads to our second kinds of suffering, suffering due to change, right? And which in Tibetan Buddhism or any other, and most of the Eastern traditions, uh, there's a concept of impermanence, right? So we all know that right, right now, as I'm speaking to you all here, hundreds of millions of uh, cells uh, have died and new cells have uh, uh, developed in our system. In the same way, so many things are changing on a regular basis. Some of those at a very tacit level, we don't know. Some of them, we are aware of it. And the issue is when we don't accept the fact that everything is changing, when, we, when, when our relationship doesn't work, when we lose something, uh, uh, any na natural calamity is stuck, when pandemic comes, then we get into a difficult situation if you're not able to live along with the fact that everything is changing. Now, that's the second one. The third one is the suffering of conditioning. Now, this one would lead to what we, what, what in Tibetan medicine, we would say the root cause of all the suffering uh, and illness, which is the suffering of conditioning is the conditioning of ignorance, right? The, in the Tibetan Buddhism, Buddhist philosophy, as well as in Tibetan medicine, ignorance is considered as the root cause of everything, every suffering and illness, because the ignorance what is the ignorance? The ignorance is the ignorance of having a belief that we are independent intrinsic self. When we have that misinformed understanding of self, that could lead to a emotion or a mental affliction such as greed, or the another form of uh, emotion could be anxiety, fear, anger, hostility, confusion, and so on and so forth, right? So how we can actually juxtapose that with the three principal energies that I presented uh, in earlier slides. The first one is, with, let's, let's look at the attachment or the greed, right? What it does is promotes lung in our system. So lung, we talked about being association with air energy, right? So everything is move, movement. What kind of a psychological impact can have? The impact can have anyone with, so we understand that lung is, same as or synonymous with nervous system. When our nervous system get really sensitive, we get heightened up. We people we tend to get more anxious, right? And so when as and when we get exposed to any kind of uh, 
uh, difficult, challenging situation, we, we, get, we get really anxious. On a long term, on a, if, if any person uh, get exposed to such kind of a situation, it can lead to a physical problem or pathological problem, which could be uh, a state of insomnia, uh, developing headaches, irritable digestion or bowel uh, movements, uh, issues related with our heart and blood uh, pressures, uh, skin being really dry, uh, uh, difficulties in moving around, uh, sus being susceptible to any kind of addictions, and then most of all, having problem with mental health. So that's very much related with not being able to understand that everything is changing and no, nothing going to stay forever, right? And therefore, we get attached to something thinking that those, those, those are permanent things. And therefore, it could lead to such issues that I just presented. The second one is anger. Now, of course, the anger and aggression could be a little could be a little different, right? One one can be angry, but doesn't necessarily have to be aggressive. But again, here in the in the broader context of uh, the afflictive emotions such as anger, what it does is it it overstimulates or promotes tipa imbalance, right? So tipa, as we understand, is the manifestation of fire. Now, what kind of a psychological impact it would have? it can cause anger. Now, as we all know, if we get angry, if we get agitated, what it does, it release, it very quickly release uh, a stress hormone in our body, such as uh, cortisol. And when we produce cortisol for a regular period of time, relentlessly, uh, our body is being flushed out with such kind of stress hormones, what it could do, it could have, it could also have, in addition to our psychological issue, it, can, it could have a uh, health problem. So uh, some of those health conditions could be uh, being sensitive to developing rashes, inflammations, infections, uh, uh, headaches such as migraine, autoimmune disorders, uh, if, if the conditions become chronic, sensitive small intestine uh, function. So sometimes people with celiac uh, uh, conditions uh, could be also due to an overlong or, or the uh, long-term causes of someone with too much of production of uh, stress uh, hormones in our system, uh, which are which is stimulated due to uh, agitated tipa or anger. Now the third one is here, we talk about delusion or close-mindedness. And what it does really is, is promotes any kind of imbalances related with Pekin. And now we all know Pekin is the manifestation of earth and water element. What kind of a psychological impact it could have? Most of the people would tend to withdraw from the uh, situation. And so sometimes, not all the time, but it's easier for such people to develop a condition of depression where we constantly uh, live in the past and ruminate over why things have happened the way it had happened, uh, why some person haven't been, uh, hasn't, uh, haven't been nice to me or cruel to me. And those things would linger. Now, ongoing issues of such nature could lead to health problems. And what kind of health problems? So here we see uh, respiratory disorders. Uh, our metabolism can really slow down. Therefore, uh, we are not able to absorb or digest much of, much of the food that we consume. Uh, blood circulation would really uh, get impacted. And due to which our, uh, a person can have problem with kidney or bladder dysfunction, some people would have a sensitive uh, bladder uh, which would lead to infection in uh, in the bl bl uh, urinary bladder and the urinary tract people would tend to easily gain weight uh, might end up with uh, being diabetes they uh, not at all a proper management of uh, glucose in our system and then one issue that we have started to see is people with this kind of a nature who have because the lung is more nervous system uh, related, right? Pekin is the other way around, and the nervous system gets pretty sluggish and slow, and therefore they tend to also be more sensitive in developing dementia. So these are some of not, not only some of the psychological impact, but also a physical uh, health conditions that it could lead to. Uh, now I will turn over the virtual mic to Mim, please. Okay, thank you, Tenzin. 
one of the questions in chat was what's the name, what's the book that I mentioned at the beginning? And it's Tibetan Medicine and You. And the last slide of this presentation has a link to the book. The publishing company in honor of these webinars is giving a 30% discount. So that's a really good deal. Anyway, we will get to that at the end of the, the slides. So Tenzin just talked about karma. And, and if we want to be happy, we need to make good choices that produce happiness. You know, most of us go around saying, well, if only he'd shape up or she'd shape up, I'd be happy. But this is empowering. It's within my own ability to be happy, regardless of what's going on around us. And we suffer when we make poor choices. We make choices that do not lead to happiness. So I'm going to focus on healing. How can we heal ourselves? And again, the focus, we're going to talk primarily about the mind. And in the next web, webinar, we will talk about what we can do to heal the body. Okay, first of all, the mental poison associated with lung, which is greed, attachment, and desire, we need to calm lung by doing what's warm, grounded, peaceful. One example is to walk safely in nature. Just get out in nature, walk around a lake, walk in a forest. It's amazing how it calms us down. And when our lung is high, we're sort of feeling like this. So I've been teaching the Tibetan medicine course for 20 years. And my students talk a lot about lung. Before an exam comes, they, they're feeling like this. And how can they calm down so that they can focus and do a good job in the exam? And Tibetan medicine can help with that. Then we need to meditate on impermanence, as Tinson was talking about. When we, we are suffering from the mental poison of greed, attachment, and desire, we say, oh, I just have to have this in order to be happy. But then maybe we get it, and we're still not happy because it's impermanent. It's constantly changing. So we need to come to accept impermanence. Things are constantly changing. And of course, what's most changing is my own self. I am going to die. And I need to come to some kind of terms with my own mortality, with aging, and with death. And the third webinar is going to focus on that. The fear about dying and death is the basic underlying fear and we, we, our other fears are not likely to go away until we come to terms with our own mortality and develop a way of living joyfully in life, even knowing that we are one day going to die. And then some actions we can take are to behave with generosity, loving kindness, and acceptance. So instead of going around being unhappy and, oh, if only I could have this, then I'd be happy, but say, I am so grateful for the way things are right now. I'm grateful for my, my human life. I'm grateful for this moment. It's mindfulness in the moment as we learn from mindfulness instruction. Next, heal from anger, hostility, and aggression. That means to cool tipa, which is heat energy. And we tell children, you know, cool down at children or angry about something, you know, sit there and be quiet. And then when you're feeling better, you will deal better with this. And that's the same for, for adults. We need to cool Tiba, our heat, and recognize it. And one way to recognize it, we're too hot. And we already know somewhat about how to cool this. If I were too hot, I'd take off my jacket. I'd take off the scarf, so I'm not so hot. Uh, you notice Tenzin is wearing a white shirt. He's in India where, what did you say it is right now? It's uh, 100, 100 degrees, 110 degrees. Yeah. 102. 102. Okay, whereas here in Golden Valley, I'm not sure what it is, but it's cold. So I have on a jacket and a scarf around my neck. <clears throat> then we also need to learn how to avoid situations that trigger anger. And uh, I finally in my life, I've, I'm learning to stay away from the kind of people where I get angry. If there's nothing I can do to help the situation, I'm best off avoiding it and try to surround myself with people who help me rise up. Then meditate on and cultivate compassion. 
And compassion is the essence of Tibetan medicine. Compassion is not the same as caring. In the case of caring, I might care for somebody, but what if that person is mean to me? Then I probably don't care very much for that person. Uh, whereas compassion is a philosophical stance. I'm going to be kind to everybody, regardless of how they behave toward me. Then I don't have to decide, okay, now do I like this person? Then I'll be kind to that person. Do I not like this person? I won't be kind. No, nope. my philosophical stance is to be kind toward everybody. And the word kindness, as my husband pointed out, comes from the word kind of the same kind. I once said that to my nursing students who didn't want to talk to patients. And I said, you know what? Patients are of the same kind as nurses. And when I said that, they were able to go in and talk to patients. They didn't see them as a different species. We are all of the same species. We are of the same kind. So we want kindness toward each other, all beings, and our planet. You know, for a long time, Tibetans have been talking about taking good care of our planet. And we could have a whole different session on that. But we need to have a healthy environment in which to flourish. Then engage in actions that relieve suffering and benefit our planet. How can I spread kindness? How can I use my life in such a way as to promote kindness? And that's a meaningful way to live. Okay, then um, the third one, the third mental poison is confusion, delusion, and closed-mindedness, which is related to bacon. So we need to warm bacon. And in the wintertime, we know we do that, is that when we're cold, we put on warmer clothes. We need to do what is dry and warm. But we also need to do that with our thoughts. And um, if in, uh, a sign of elevated bacon or cold energy means it's hard to get things done. My students procrastinate and they, then the papers do and they say, oh, I can't, you know, can you give me a couple more days? And one way to warm up bacon is to go out and exercise vigorously, get the metabolism up, uh, you know, get everything going again. And to meditate on wisdom. Wisdom means to wake up and see everything as it is, not the way we want it to be. If we go around like this, I'm only going to look at what's between my hands. I'm not going to be able to make good choices. And in yoga, we have to look all around, up and down, see everything. But we need to do that with the mind also. If we see everything as it is, not the way we want it to be, we're going to make better choices that produce better consequences. And we need to be fully aware of the moment so that we are dealing well with each moment. And that's mindfulness, of course. Then cultivate open-mindedness, reach out to help others in our planet. And in Tibetan medicine, we want an open heart, be open-hearted and not just close up. I, you know, I'm suffering enough. I don't wanna hear about what's going on in Ukraine or what's you know, suffering here in, in Minnesota. Be open-minded, and that's a way to let the energy, we're made of energy, let the energy flow freely, and then we'll be much healthier. And happiness. That's the purpose of Tibetan medicine. What's the point of life if we aren't happy? But it's within our own reach to be happy. So we can cultivate these characteristics, and one day we'll wake up and say, you know what, I'm happy. Love, compassion, kindness, satisfaction, equanimity, responsibility, altruism, forgiveness. And the forgiveness isn't to say, oh, it's okay that that person treated me badly. It's to no longer be carrying around the burden of resentment and anger. Resilience, peace, patience, humility, tolerance, empathetic joy. That's a tough one, especially in academia. That means that if somebody else gets a job or has some kind of success that I would like to have, then I'm happy for the person instead of tearing the person down or somehow diminishing the success that my colleague has. 
spiritual immunity. The first I heard of that term was in Tibetan medicine. And it's like physical immunity. Physical immunity is building up the body so it can deal with toxins. But we need to develop spiritual immunity too so we can deal with uh, emotional toxins that affect us. And then finally, joy. I am so joyful about my life. This is the American lotus. And the lotus seed needs to grow in mud in order to germinate and rise up and bloom. Let's go to the next one. And a few years ago, my neighbor planted the lotus in a, a it was a, a swamp. It's a swamp right near where my house is. And for years, I'd walked by that swamp without seeing it. But all of a sudden, I looked and the swamp had become a garden. And it's just, and it was absolutely beautiful. My, the neighbor moved away and now it's back to being a swamp again. But it's, I show it to my students because it, it, it gives us, it can inspire us to live a life in which we rise up and bloom, that we can transform the mud in our life into nourishment so that we rise and bloom. And if I were to talk to each one of you at this webinar, you would tell me about suffering in your life. Everybody has suffering in their life. And, um, and so think in terms of how can you transform this into nourishment, that, that this can make you stronger, not that we, it's a good thing that we suffer, but how can I use this to become a better person? The Dalai Lama says that, that difficult people and situations can make us into better people if we develop compassion. And some of the most compassionate people I know have gone through some really tough things. So. If enough of us do this, we can create a garden, a beautiful garden in the world. So we talked about karma, universal law of cause and effect. We want to choose what produces balance, health, and happiness. And we constantly have, the, have choices to make. All of us, if a tornado comes through, it affects all of us. It doesn't affect the people who are virtuous different than the people who are not virtuous. But it's not what happens to us, but how we deal with it. How can we turn this into something positive rather than sabotage ourselves by getting into negativity? Suffering, unhappy feelings resulting from mental poisons and unhealthy choices. Suffering and pain are not the same in Tibetan medicine. If I fall off this chair and hurt myself, I'm going, to, I'm going to experience pain. The suffering comes by how I interpret that. If I interpret it from a negative perspective, then whatever pain I feel is going to feel much worse. So how can we stop uh, uh, making things worse and instead turn this into something positive? Then healing, root out and transform negativity into wisdom, compassion, sustainable peace. Finally, Cultivate characteristics that create joy and then bloom like a lotus flower. Now, Tenzin's going to take over. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so, we'll conclude by all of us using our common virtual space to engage in what we all discussed until now, and especially what Mim talked about in terms of transforming our difficult situations, adversity, or even suffering into happiness and joy. So as I would understand that most of us here, almost all of you here would understand or have some understanding of what is Tonglen meditation. So Tonglen in Tibetan literally means to give and to take in, right? But then it's not about giving something to someone and then taking something from those people in terms of material thing. Here, the language that has been used is very much contingent upon giving out, breathing out the compassion and then breathing in suffering as we have here. Now, I also quickly want to share here, this meditation would be a short one, but I want to preface it by saying that when I was doing my research work, looking at how uh, people are dying, how 
people are caring for someone with a terminal illness in Tibetan refugee community. One theme that came out over and over is how they're able to use the movement of suffering to empathize for others, how they're able to make an effort to understand how other people might be suffering if they are in his or her situation. So I think that's a really important way to look at how sometimes we can also, and they, they, they always tend to use one or other form of tone and meditation to engage in such transformation. So let's try, try to be in the most comfortable way as we can can sit or lie down comfortably. And if you don't have any physical condition, uh, be comfortable, but try to straighten up your spine. So, which would be to, to sit straight back, relax your body. And the whole thing is to turn your focus or attention inside inside your mind. You can close your eyes or lift it half closed or look at the space right in front of you. So most important thing here is to focus on your breath. Let's engage in circular breathing. Breathe slowly, deeply, and evenly through your nostrils, from your abdomen, with the in-breath the same length as the out-breath, and no break between in-breath and out-breath, which is have a uniform, slow, yet continuous breath. So now that we have our focus on our breathing, let's do Tonglen first for ourselves. So now I will use the language here to tone in for yourself. As you breathe in, let your greed, attachment, anger, jealousy, delusion, and so on. These are all the afflictive emotions we discussed earlier. And bring those emotions to the surface. Now let's breathe out all this negativity and fill yourself with compassion. So now let's do Tonglen for someone you love. Breathe in your loved one's suffering like black, like black smoke into your heart center and breathe out compassion to the person. Your loved ones want to be happy, but not too often makes, but too often makes poor choices that produce suffering instead. Open your heart to your loved one. Now let's do Tonglen for someone that you don't know, someone neutral. Breathe in the person's suffering, like black smoke, into your heart center and breathe out compassion to the person. Like everyone else, this individual also wants to be happy, but may, but may make the mistake of producing suffering instead. Open your heart to the person. Now let's do Tonglen for someone you don't like. Breathe in the person's suffering, like black smoke into your heart center and breathe out compassion to the individual. These challenging individuals wants to be happy as well, but is suffering because of mental poisons or the afflictive emotions. Open your heart to the person. Now let's do Tonglen for the world. We all know the world need it. We have been relentlessly 
exposed to things happening one after another. Breathe in the world suffering, like black smoke into your heart center and breathe out compassion to the world. Open your heart to the world's suffering. Now let's once again focus on yourself, purify yourself. You don't want to end up keeping all the black smoke within yourself. This might also cause some kind of harm to your system. At the end of your meditation, visualize the suffering you breathed in as black smoke in your heart center. Breathe out this black smoke completely, or this negativity could cause suffering to you, for you. Then fill your heart and your whole being with compassion toward yourself, all living beings and the world. You can open your eyes and orient yourself to your surroundings and to yourself. Thank you for being part of this beautiful collective environment. Thank you. I'll hand it over to Mim. Uh, Mim, you want to talk a bit about the resources that is available for others, and then we can fill some questions. Uh, Okay, the next uh, webinar series will be on May 17th at noon. Tenzin and I will teach it and we'll focus on, on the body instead. Uh, these are two books. Uh, I read, wrote Carmen Happiness and you can click the link if you're interested in it to buy it from the University of Minnesota Bookstore. And then here's the book that I mentioned that Tenzin and I just published. And that, that right now you can get a 30% discount. And then finally, um, we have two graduate courses about Tibetan medicine. Uh, uh, this one I've been teaching for 20 years and it's on online now. And we would love to have you come and take this. Then for students who take this course, uh, then they are eligible to take the courses going to Dharamsala, India, where, where um, uh, Tenzin graduated. And these courses, I can tell you from my years of teaching them, these are life transforming. It's going to make just a huge difference in your life if you learn these teachings and apply them in your life. So that's our slide presentation, and we are open to questions now. First of all, I want to thank you both so much for this wonderful presentation today. What a lovely way to begin with that very meditative video and then to have your presentation and then end with the Tonglen um, meditation. So it was just a beautiful, a beautiful time together. So a few questions have come in. Um, and the first one, and I'll let the two of you decide who 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 you want to answer, you know, each, each question. First question is, suffering seems to cause the same health problems that stress does. Is there a role for stress in Tibetan medicine? I can start with that. You know, sure. stress is not necessarily negative. I felt stress before this webinar. I always feel stress before I give a public talk, even though I've been giving public talks for decades, but it makes me more alert. When stress is not good, is that if it becomes more chronic or keeps us from functioning well. And that's what Tibetan medicine is warning us against. Tenzin, do you have anything uh, to add to that? I, yeah, thank you, ma'am. And this is a great question. Uh, thanks for asking this question. I can only add to what Mim said, and I certainly second what Mim said earlier. But one thing, again, kind of bringing in the Tibetan medicine uh, lens in here is we all respond or react to stress in different ways, right? And so uh, we usually always say, as we uh, emphasized earlier, people with different nature, for instance, people with lung can have a different psychological impact uh, versus people with uh, pagan. Uh, who have a more kind of a coolness nature in the system and they would react to stress in a very different manner than again as compared to someone with cheaper nature right and so someone who has a very cheaper nature 
person, then the way they would react to stress could be a pe person might get agitated, angry, and sometimes might also have uh, an, uh, an inclination to engage in aggressive behavior, right? Uh, people with uh, more lung nature can engage, can re uh, react or respond to stress uh, in a very kind of a dramatic and anxious uh, manner. And therefore, sometimes they would just kind of uh, completely uh, go numb and uh, not really being function at all. And I think that additional element to uh, stress is not necessarily bad, but also sometimes uh, being becoming habitual or, uh, to the way we react to different stress stimuli can also uh, translate into having a chronic way of reacting to stress and therefore can then uh, boil down to some kind of a mental health issue. And I think that's, uh, that's quite important to have that understanding. Mm, thank you for that, um, Tenzin and Mim. You know, there's a, a few questions about the courses since you've talked about the courses and um, Teresa wrote in the chat that she took the courses in 2009 and it was life changing and that it was really helpful to um, listen to the webinar today to review the concepts and and one question was are the courses open to people in the community and I know the answer to that is yes. Um, the other question is when is the next India trip. Uh, yeah, I mean, go ahead. We don't know yet. We're hoping it'll it, it ordinarily it's during May session. That's the session between um, uh, spring semester and summer session. It's the last two weeks in May, the first week in, in June. The course has been on hold uh, for what is it three years because of COVID. So if COVID cooperates, the next course will be next May session. But you have to take the Tibetan medicine course first. Uh, thanks, uh, Teresa, for what you said. And I saw Nancy, you also, and, and, and Claire, you wrote about taking these courses. So you, so um, the course will be offered this fall. It starts on September 6th. Uh, the Tibetan medicine course, CSPH 5315, certainly members of the community can take the course. Almost every semester, they're members of the community. So take that, and then we will have information this fall about whether or not the, the India course 5318 will be offered during May session, and we hope so, if COVID, mm -hmm. per, if COVID permits. Yeah. So another question came in um, asking about um, suggestions that you have for helping somebody that's dealing with grief following the, the death of a loved one. And so what would be the Tibetan medicine approach to that? Enzin, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mary Jo. And also thank you for asking this question. I, this is really an important question because uh, we we often don't realize that realize the importance of grieving, right? And so, uh, every different cultural culture has different way of informing their community members the way they grieve. And uh, in so many ways, uh, the way we grieve is also supported by different cultural. Uh, uh, engaged activities, which could be the family members or community members, and sometimes in the modern uh, modern culture, the community members uh, becomes more a kind of a healthcare personal, right? And and so, but in other uh, cultural setting like the the uh, the community where I am in right now. Uh, the com community members is very much beyond the health personnel. So there are all these people who come in and, 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 and support the person to grieve together. The other thing is also, I think, what kind of a cultural uh, narratives and stories that are being associated with grieving. And so, for instance, I can speak uh, for the work that I'm doing and the research that I'm working on is looking at the uh, Buddhist uh, community members, how they're doing that. And one of the key uh, philosophical concept, which we introduced before, is again about the concept of impermanence. Right? And so the, the impermanence doesn't necessarily mean that everything is constantly changing, right? But it also speaks to the fact that the moment anything is based on cause and effect, the moment anything is born due to the causes of something else, 
that very moment, that particular thing is in the trajectory of uh, getting to the, to an end, right? And so therefore, I think if we lose something, whether in the form of a person, if someone dies, or in the form of materialistic thing, if you lose something in natural calamities, something get burned down, uh, again, there's the same thing, right? Anything that is based on any kind of a causative factor is leading toward uh, uh, getting to an end. And so, so such kind of a cultural, uh, concept that built up stories or narratives really help in grieve, grieving in a more kind of holistic and positive manner and therefore being able to process and digest any kind of a difficulty or, or adversity uh, that a person or a, a group of community members are going through. Mm. Thank you for that, Tenzin. Our time has gone so quickly today. I really want to thank both of you so much for sharing your wisdom today. And I do encourage you to take a look at the chat at all the meaningful comments that have come in from the people who so enjoyed your presence um, today. I also want to acknowledge and thank all of our staff at the Bakken Center who helped make today's webinar possible. If you'd like to learn more about the Center's Tibetan Medicine Program, we'll include that information in the post-webinar email. And remember, Molly said at the beginning that she'll be sending out that um, post-webinar email, and that will also have a copy of um, today's slide slides. So again, thanks to all of you so much for being with us today, and have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks to everybody. Thank you.